we have the power to choose and we have the power to choose whether to know or to not to know. Obviously, it's easier to live ignorantly and blissfully, but I wanted to suppose in my short time frame of life within the sort of universe time frame do something I won't regret afterwards. Forwardism. The joy of seeing and feeling tomorrow before it's been created. Continually challenging convention to push for certainty of a better experience when we get there. This is Forwardism. Hi everyone, my name is Jomi Adegoke and welcome to This Is Forwardism, a new audio series by BMW for those who live for tomorrow today. In this series, I'll be talking to creative minds who are creating, shaping and designing our future. Together, me and my guests will put together the pieces to create a picture of the future whilst finding out what their definition of forwardism is and what it means to them. So who will be coming with us on our forwardism journey today? So today's brilliant guest is the one and only Dian Jen Lin. Now, Dian Jen has been described as, and this is a mouthful, an interdisciplinary designer with the academic rigor of a researcher, the analytical rationality of a scientist, and the aesthetic sensitivity of an artist. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds thoroughly impressive to me. Together with her colleague, Hannes Hulstadt, Diane Jen, who goes by DJ, founded the Post Carbon Lab, a company that started as a transdisciplinary design and research studio and has now shifted into a research and development company for microbial coloration and textile finishing technology. Hi, DJ. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> Great. I'm excited. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So looking forward to taking you on our forwardism journey. Um, so, DJ, mm -hmm. for those who don't know you, what should our listeners know about you? Tell us an interesting fact about yourself. Um, interesting fact. I like foraging. Is that interesting? <laughs> That's very interesting. Tell me more. Um, I think I use foraging as a means to sort of reacquaint myself with the nature. And one of the important ways to perceive how things around me react to potentially our being or our not being. So, I mean, uh, a bit of a background is that because I'm originally Taiwanese and I live in a very subtropical kind of climate. And five, six years ago, I moved to London, which has temperate climate, European kind of weather. It's very, very different from what it's like in Taiwan. And I found the fauna and flora very different here as well. And that's very inspiring to me. So in our mm. practice, we do occasionally use, you know, seasonal plants, uh, flowers to create pigmentations, to create colors. So I think it's all part of the narrative of what we do. And I can talk mm. more about it later. Yes, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, <laughs> I mean, we asked for an interesting fact and that definitely was one. <laughs> so the podcast is called, as you know, This is Forwardism. When you hear the term forwardism, what does it mean to you? Well, I suppose what it stands out is the moving forward part. And right. I think the way that word hits me is that there's two aspects of it. Obviously, there's the positive side and then the negative side. As you all find out later on, I'm a very <laughs> dystopian person. <laughs> so I'll start with the negative side. I think no matter what we do and no matter how we choose to um, face and interact with the incident that happens to us or happens around us, we have to move forward and there's no way of going back. You know, you can't hit pause and rewind on your life, on the times that we're living. And we will have to move forward. The only choice we have is to opt for a more optimistic attitude to face it, or, you know, as pessimistic or as um, negative as you'd like to be. But that's not going to 
<laughs> bring us anywhere. So I think the positive side is that we still have choice and power inside us to pick and to deliberate, to spend all your mental and brain energy to figure out what's the right for you next. And that's empowering because, you know, despite all these, you know, Ukrainian war, uh, COVID and all these incidents happening around us, making us, you know, rendered us completely helpless, we still have, you know, a power in us to choose. And I think that's wonderful to live for, isn't it? For that forwardism, I suppose. That's how <laughs> I interpreted it. A very good interpretation. Um, I want to talk a little bit more. <laughs> since no you, you do seem like a, <laughs> you're a bit of a forwardism expert from that um, excellent description. Thank you. So I could probably tell you in many words why we wanted to speak to you for this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's a bit more difficult to speak about yourself in such <laughs> complimentary terms. But I do want to know why you think in your humble opinion, we wanted to speak to you today. Um, what is it about yourself and your journey that embodies the spirit of forwardism? Um, I think I myself, I'm definitely propelled by that concept per se, not just the inevitable rolling of time on the sort of uh, <laughs> fortune of wheel. <laughs> um, but also on the other hand, I think, I suppose I'm... Lucky <laughs> in a way <laughs> that you have come across my work and then in the sort of fortunate information web that we are all immersed ourselves today, somehow some information, some image, some notions that you saw and come across that I have shared with the world that connected with you. And I'm really glad that, you know, we're in this room, in this conversation space that I presume that I've made some ripples inside your mind, inside your brain that Certainly. made you feel like, oh, happy to hear what DJ's got to say today. <laughs> We're very much looking forward to seeing what else you've got to say today, including what would you say? I mean, you've kind of touched on it already, but what would you say propels and does drive you forward aside from, you know, the constant turning of, you know, the wheel of fortune on this mortal coil <laughs> of us? Oh, I have quite a journey from uh, for coming from where I was to where I am today, like a personal journey, I suppose. I think right. it's similar to what I've described, because I think I came from a design slash research kind of background. And as a designer, it has been very perplexing to me the moment I found out how damaging and how detrimental our production, design, manufacturing attitude towards the planet is. It's entirely exploitative and built on a, you know, capitalistic uh, mismatch information to be able to extort something, you know, for our own benefits. I know that now is changing a bit, but say a decade ago when I first entered the labour market, let's say, it was disheartening, I would say. I feel like we live in a place where the only thing that we can do to our mother, our home, is to continuously extort it. And if I were to pass away, if we were to cease to exist as a human species, all we've left is trash and pollution and waste. And, <laughs> and I think to myself, why? We have the power to choose and we have the power to choose whether to know or to not to know. Obviously, it's easier to live ignorantly and blissfully, but I wanted to suppose in my short time frame of life within the sort of universe time frame, do something I won't regret afterwards. I feel like I got like a bit carried away in that sort of train. <laughs> do drag me back. I, I do that no, sometimes. Powerful stuff. No, it's... <laughs> I definitely won't because it was fascinating. But also very powerful stuff and very, I'd say, timely and stuff that <laughs> will resonate with a lot of listeners because I think that conversation has certainly been Aww. at the forefront of a lot of our minds, definitely, um, <laughs> in the past few years. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we will be talking about that sort of theme later on in our interview. But I want to kind of take it back a little bit yes, yes. to the beginning 
<laughs> for those who, again, might not be as well immersed in the conversation in terms of what you do. Mm-hmm. So um, you and Hannes mm-hmm. founded um, the Post Carbon Lab, mm-hmm. a transdisciplinary design research studio. So let's start with the basics. For those who might not know, what does transdisciplinary research actually mean? It literally is just... Um if you sort of dissect the word into the prefix of trends and then the suffix of disciplinary, it just means we work across and um, beyond the sort of definition of disciplines. Because obviously, you know how our education system sits us to study a few subjects or, you know, the further you go on, you can only get, say, a bachelor in applied science or something like that. And it's all quite, like, um, segmented. So we try to work against those segmentations, against those silos, to be able to merge things together almost fearlessly because I think sometimes it seems daunting to sort of cross that barrier into the unknown, <laughs> essentially. But we try to encourage that. We encourage, say, our employees, our team, and our collaborators, our partners, to be able to say, oh, if we ask that what if, and then if that what if responds to our why, then we look into that, you know, put a project proposal, put it down to milestones, and then give it a prototype experiment shot. Why not? <laughs> so... That's essentially what we do in terms of transdisciplinary. And then there's the design part, there's the research part to sort of, you know, intertwine to investigate what the meaning of the design is through research, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And also very much embodies, I think, the spirit of Fordism in terms of oh. <laughs> it's like it could work. Don't you think it could work as a almost um, descriptor of what Fordism is in many ways also? I think I'll find out probably further towards the end of the podcast why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I mean, I personally think it probably makes a lot of sense to everyone already. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's only a few questions in. Um, okay. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about how um, the idea for Post Carbon Lab came about. Mm -hmm. So what Post Carbon Lab really embodies is post carbon refers to post carbon emissions. Right. So what it means is that we are proposing a question that is what happens after we don't have to rely so heavily on carbon-based solutions and uh, sustenance. So what that sort of mainly refers to are, say, some heavy carbon-intensive materialities and infrastructure around us. For instance, (laughs) if you're lost already, for instance, (laughs) you know, fossil fuel-derived energies, plastics, which is all from fossil fuels, and agriculture, carnivore-based diet, lifestyles, and sort of everything that embodies the complexities from these three base infrastructures, such as fashion, for instance, you know, polyesters in our our garments, synthetic colorants in our, you know, products and interior, anything that's around us. And as a post-carbon lab, we embody these, um, I suppose, philosophies, ideologies, and try to experiment. We're a testing ground. We're a place where these fearless explorations take place to understand whether these new speculations, new designs, and new bodies of research, do they have a place in our current existing societal, economical biological frameworks. Right. And I mean, I think, again, you've touched a little bit on um, what it was you wanted to achieve, you know, when it first started in terms of, you know, how Mm -hmm. you got there. But I'm interested, I suppose, in whether that mission statement has in any way changed or developed at all over the years, especially Mm -hmm. since the conversation um, around these issues has become somewhat more mainstream and is more sort of normalised in recent years. Mm Mm-hmm. That is an interesting one. So um, obviously, when we first started, we called ourselves the Transdisciplinary Design Research Studio right. with a focus on regenerative sustainability. 
and dignity. So the same, these are still the main mottos of our company, studio, lab, workshop <laughs> uh, <laughs> operation. <laughs> We're a bunch of things. <laughs> And we still revolve around these core ethos. However, um, when we first started, we've worked on a bunch of transdisciplinary design research projects, such as uh, we looked into sustainability communication on the interface of daily commodities. And then we work with the UNHCR to produce a project for humanitarian causes for kind of like a human resources platform for the Syrian refugees since they're displaced and right. restrained in a location. So we've worked on a variety of projects that embodies the sort of sustainability and the dignity aspect of what we do. Uh, there was then another project we worked on, which was to explore using microorganisms as a source for coloration. A bit of context, <laughs> sightline, is that more than 99% of the colorants are currently adopted in our world. Um, you know, things that you see that are man-made around you, you know, from your clothes, from the chairs, from the tables to the cutleries. Everything you see that embodies a color that isn't originally its color are from fossil fuels. Mm. That means coal, that means oil, that means through the process of manufacturing, they could have heavy metals or carcinogens. Wow. And we're, you know, our skin is our largest organ and we're wearing them, we're, you know, coming in contact with them. And in some ways you can be absorbing these environmental toxins, as they call it. And while we were researching this subject, we were then uh, working with microbial-based colorants and pigments. And that's when we realized, oh, there is a need in the sort of London, because we were being active in East London, and then there is a need. There's a demand from the designers and the brands communities, but there's not a lot of access because... Like I said, predominantly everything is fossil fuel based. And as a studio, as a company, we also need to, uh, you know, change and adapt ourselves to find a better, you know, business model, business structure to be able to survive in this still predominantly capitalistic world. So I think we learned from the past experiences that if you want <laughs> to survive, to be a company, you still need to have a specialism. You still need to have a, I suppose, a thing that you're known for. So we made the, I suppose, executive decision to focus more on microbial-based solutions. So that means microbial coloration, finishing, coating. And we have a trademark on photosynthetic coating, which is what we produce on textiles to make them photosynthesize. And it's a journey that we started without necessarily knowing what it's going to be. But the universe has been throwing us these curveballs, not in a bad way, in the most excellent way that yeah. we are happy to see that the industry and the brands are coming up. And they're thinking, making these investigative conversations and discussions within them and then they come to us and be like can you do this <laughs> and we'd be like oh we haven't necessarily tried that we may have some routes to do this and that to do some r&d to support you but we can see how it goes from there and that's the kind of conversations right. i have on a daily basis <laughs> Thank you so much, DJ. God, it's so interesting. There's so many things that I suppose when we have the conversation around fossil fuels, mm -hmm. um, they're just swathes of things you don't think about. I mean, the coloration conversation is just something that, oh. you know, I've, it's never occurred to me. Oh, don't worry. You're not <laughs> In alone. In 30 years, it's never You're occurred to me. You're not alone. It's still very, uh, we're still on the sustainability in the fashion spectrum, you know, scope. We're still talking about maybe ultra fast fashion <laughs> if you've seen and right. then and then fast fashion and i think you know even on the modern savory side on the the cost right. of these <laughs> ridiculously cheap garments i think that's where mm. we are now we're not yet asking Absolutely. What is the material? Where is the material come from? Where mm. is this color coming from? And it just takes time still. Mm. You mentioned regenerative sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a project, regenerative sustainability activism, mm -hmm. I think the term is. Could you talk 
us through what that mm-hmm. is. Um, yeah, that sounds, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> no worries. It's essentially kind of an evolved concept of how I perceive what we do, as well as how we'd like, I suppose, the lexicon around sustainability communication can be more navigating to words. So I've prepared my (laughs) definition uh, evolution here. (laughs) So as sustainability has become quite a buzzword, it also actually has a connotation in the sort of, I suppose, academia, a connotation of it being not accurate and progressive enough as how Mm. we collective as a species should do. So here, the definition of sustainability is the quality of not being harmful to the environment or depleting natural resources and thereby supporting long-term ecological balance. This is the dictionary uh, definition for sustainability. And through this definition, you can tell that it's trying to tell us we are trying to not do harm to our surroundings but is that going to be good enough? We already know that this is where the temperature that has rise. We've seen extreme weather. We've seen, you know, especially within the foraging community, everybody's seeing, oh, you're a weird plant that shouldn't be here in this season, but you're here already. And nature's mm. sending us signals to tell us all these little things that a modern urban night person would necessarily pick up. It takes, uh-huh. you know, you need to train yourself to be more aware with the natural surroundings to be able to pick up. And when nature's sending us these signals, if we only pertain to the quality of not being harmful, I don't think it's going <laughs> to, we're not going to be there in... Yeah, it's not, it's a low it's, sort it's, of um, threshold. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. even the bare minimum because what happens to the yeah. damage that has been done in the past, right? Absolutely. So then the next step that we've, I suppose, coined is regenerative sustainability. So what it does is that it tackles the blind spot of passively alleviating environmental burdens. And um, it takes a positive term to uh, regenerate, detox, and purify the surroundings to accelerate environmental catharsis. What it means is that if we have the power to inflict so much harm and so much pollution in our surroundings. We also have the equal power to say, today, I don't want to, you know, dump more pollution and waste into the environment. Right. I'm going to put something positive that can inflict a yeah. beneficial ripple chain effect to, you know, my surroundings, to the environment. And that's what regenerative sustainability means. And then the further step where we put in even a further concept is to combine um, regenerative sustainability with design activism. So what it means is that it's, we are aiming to inspire more designers and draw their attention to this underdeveloped design space for more environmentally beneficial prompts, designs, concepts, projects, initiatives. Mm. So it embeds the social community, embeds the the sort of most powerful thing humans can do is that collective spirit, collective action. Absolutely. I love that concept. <laughs> I think so much of the conversation, understandably, you can feel quite helpless and it can feel quite draining. But I think what you just said to me in the most basic sort of layman's terms is, you know, making the world proactively a better place. And I love that idea because I think with this conversation, you can feel extremely helpless. Mm -hmm. But I love that, you know, this conversation sort of looking at what we can do um, and that power that we have to actually, you know, um, do something good actively as opposed to just passively not creating harm. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, it's easier to live more passively and just like, you know, do what you have to do on a nine to five, you know, job, professional basis. And then, you know, live on your life based on what decisions have been offered to you on the shelf in a shop. Right. And it's much more inconvenient to think, oh, to stand in front of shelf and think, oh, where did that come from? Hmm, let's look at these tiny fonts in the right. back to see, oh, okay, what is this? It is inconvenient i would say but 
Right. If you practice, train yourself to, you know, take that little step of putting in a little bit of mind, mental effort, I think you deserve applause. You deserve to give yourself an applause to say, oh, I'm practicing to be more mindful. I'm practicing to be more aware of the materiality, the entities around me. Right. So we're giving Post Carbon Lab the biggest round of applause. <laughs> we're all currently clapping into our, <laughs> into our speakers. Um, I would love to speak to you about the very innovative process mm-hmm. um, that you guys are, you know, sort of coined in 2014. So very nearly a decade ago, um, photosynthetic <laughs> coating. So. Mm-hmm. Right, clearly, which is obviously, you know, to the average person, an average listener might seem quite niche. So mm-hmm. I'm interested in back then, I mean, it could be quite niche in 2022. So in 2014, mm-hmm. what were the initial kind of reactions to the idea? Oh, Did horrible. you have lots of supporters? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Tell me more. Um, I remember presenting a sort of earlier stage mock-up of this piece of research to my tutor at the time. I was studying in a fashion design kind of degree in Taiwan, and this is the most traditional, most mass production oriented sort of scenario you can imagine. And yeah, they just don't see the point. My teacher Mm. at the time sort of like, called it outright disgusting. (laughs) Wow. First of all, they don't see the point of the question I'm asking. I think it's really sad that in my education when I was in Asia, that a lot of questions that I had back then weren't answered. Well, if they can't answer it, I understand. But they were called outright irrelevant. And Mm. I think that was something that I had to live through to who I am today. I think whoever has the courage to bring up that question, which might seem weird and bizarre, might be coming from a different context, I embrace them with respect and with a bit of my own critical thinking before giving an outright Mm. no or disgusting. (laughs) And for living garments, living textiles, textiles embedded with microbes or other living matters, a lot of people, I think also the mundane people would think, why would you want that? And on the other hand, they'd think, what's the point? The majority of the people probably listening to this podcast already have quite some life mm, tasks that they have to manage on a daily basis. And, you know, we all got that much amount of mental capacity to deal with uncertainties, contingencies, these kind of scenarios that requires a lot of brain power to process. And then if something else comes along, like, what about a living garment? What about living textiles? <laughs> They'd be like, oh, is that relevant to me? I don't know. <laughs> so I understand that reaction because that is what we've been dealing with for the past, what, eight years? <laughs> and um, right. it's really up until these past few years. In 2017, we won the Caring Award with Scarlett McCartney through a collaboration project with the Natural History Museum. Oh, wow. That was a turning point for me that I think. Mm. What? People in a luxury fashion conglomerate is actually interested in this in some ways? Is my questions finally relevant? (laughs) Because, you know, I've been seeing, you know, the waste the fashion industry chucks out. When I was an intern, we've had to cut up perfectly fine pieces of garment and bin them into trash so that all goes to landfill. You know, also have to cut the labels and everything because that is wow. the designers, the brand's intellectual property. They can't risk it being resold, reappear in the market space in a much lower price, which would render their products, mm. uh, you know, not competitive anymore. Mm. I mean, just from that part that I've described, you can tell that the value system is wrong, right? <laughs> Absolutely. If anything's disgusting, it's probably that, isn't it? I'm so grateful (laughs) that you're saying that. But 
back in 2014, my tutor was a very prominent, um, you know, she was very active in the design space, in the fashion world. She was, at the time, I thought that whatever she says is, you know, correct. Right. So what can I say? I survived, I guess. <laughs> yes, more than survived. You thrived. You thrived, thank God. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, as you've touched on the attitudes around sustainability, mm-hmm have definitely changed definitely. since 2014, yes. since, it, you know, it was considered inverted commas irrelevant. You know, I don't know what a bigger kind of sign that your questions are relevant is than, you know, a co-sign from Stella McCartney. <laughs> um, you've worked with Alexandra McQueen. Mm-hmm. You've done some incredible things. Um, but of course, we know that there are still people with questions and there are still people with criticism. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested in how you go about convincing mm-hmm. those, you know, remaining critics when it comes to the idea of sustainable fashion? I think the best that we can, anyone can do to go against somebody with a completely opposite opinion with you, it's starting with mutual respect, establishing some common grounds you would have. You know, and there are some facts that we can't ignore. Okay, climate change is real. <laughs> Extreme right. weathers are real. Every single summer we're seeing, oh, this is the highest temperature yet again, another highest temperature ever recorded in history. I mean, if you are living in a world that you can acknowledge these facts, then I think we can establish some common grounds and we can establish that, if we can, that human collective activities are leading to some of these phenomena that we have observed. The rising concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere, all these things. If we can establish that, then we can go further to investigate, does fashion have the space in this conversation? Does textile have a space in this conversation? So in uh, last year's COP26 summit, we were invited to speak. And also it was actually (laughs) ever in the history of COP26 in the climate summits that the fashion industry is first time ever involved. And yet statistics suggest that the fashion industry contributes to 10% of that carbon emissions, of humanity's carbon emissions in total. Yeah, it seems a bit belated, that invitation. Well, yeah, but it's also, (laughs) there is a historical reason to that, you know, because fashion Mm. is very poorly regulated, not like architecture Mm. or automotive. And um, we've got like the ultra fast fashion even emerging again. And the regulations on those elements still in infant early stages, even though we have loads of evidence present. It just takes time for the regulations to follow up. Thank you so much, DJ. Um, We've heard some incredible things about what Post Carbon Lab has achieved so far. And I'm very excited to hear about what you, I suppose, still want to achieve, what your plans are for the future, especially given how ahead of the game you guys were in 2014. I can imagine what you're working on now is probably (laughs) light years ahead, 2040 stuff. So we'd love to hear about what you guys are doing and what you hope to do. Um... So for the moment, we offer microbial coloration and finishing right. as well as photosynthetic coating R&D service or treatment for textile-based businesses. And what that means is that any textile businesses, you know, whether you're in fashion, accessories, footwear, automotive, interior product, architecture, some people from aerospace even got in contact to see wow. if you use textiles in whatever you're giving out to the world. There's a space where we can come in and we can help you do the research and development to see if, say, we can embed some climate positivity through involving algae or cyanobacteria photosynthetic microorganisms to you know, potentially mitigate that carbon footprint or to the extent if we're Uh, looking at some kind of scale, then we're able to sort of scale up that climate positivity as well. And along with that, you can also just be a company that wants to replace the original, say, color formula you're using, like 
say if you're a brand that has a classic green color and、uh, you'd like to not use those heavy metals or fossil fuel derived colorants in your coloring formulas, you can come to us and we say, let's see if we can make this color you want. With the microbial formulas, so、right. that's kind of what we do now as a business. And at the same time, we're currently developing some patent creation through bioprinting. So it's a bit like three D printing, but then with like living organisms. <laughs> <Wow> . And, <laughs> and then、um, we also do all kinds of different R and D projects that the industry are interested in having us explore. For instance,、uh, the denim industry got in touch and looking into some microbial based washing techniques. So it's really up to what you're interested in exploring in shifting your company's, you know, say sustainability agenda, and will come in and be a very collaborative, very experimental partner to help you make that shift. Thank you, DJ. I feel like um, 3D printing with living organisms is probably an episode in itself. That sounds <laughs> that sounds absolutely <laughs> fascinating. But we're now reaching our kind of imagine segment of the. Podcast where、mm-hmm. I'd like you to take us on a bit of a journey in terms of what you imagine the future of textile production might look like in 2050. Oh, and please give us as much detail in your kind of imaginary description of that as possible. I believe that to this date we have already produced all the textiles and all the garments that we need. As a population, of course, the population、mm. is growing, but honestly, we're not wearing or using the garments we already have as enough times、Absolutely. as they are supposed to be worn or to be used. So I hope that by 2050, if we're still here, if I'm still here as Homo sapiens, <laughs> I hope textile production would be minimal, and I hope、mm. that. If we're producing any textile products, they would be at least climate positive. We can't continue to pursue carbon neutral. It, it's <laughs> if we live in a world where it started being neutral, we can continue to pursue carbon neutral. But we're not. We have、right. so much environmental debt already. And then you're like,、oh, I'm going to try to be carbon neutral, but you're like minus fifty, minus fifty. I don't know every month. Imagine that's like a bank account. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it would. It just wouldn't add up, you know, mathematically speaking.、Um, okay, so apart from minimal textile production, I hope because there are a lot of initiatives like through carbon farming, regenerative agriculture. You know, wool is a really powerful fiber that they're able to、mm. sequester, you know, carbon dioxide through the production chain, and then so you could have a piece of, you know, climate positive wool sweater. Though obviously, you know, you've got to care for it and not like burn it or something. Use it mindfully and consciously. So we already have these solutions, you know, like climate positive wool, climate positive fibers. Even though at the moment they're not to the scale to accommodate the population growth, but don't forget we've got loads of treasures in landfill. <laughs>、mm. And I think in 2050, ideally. At the starting point of each production line, it's bound to be climate positive times whatever the capacity you're producing. Right, that's what I would hope for. Yeah, DJ, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> I literally think I've come away from this conversation with a higher IQ. I'm serious. <laughs> I've been a lot smarter post this chat. Thank、um, you. So thank you so much for、um, taking the time. It's been amazing. Thank you for you too. So, guys, sadly, today's episode is over, but we will, as always, continue to push forward. Stay tuned for our next episode with another exciting creative mind. But in the meantime, check out the other BMW original podcasts. I've been Yomi Degake, and this is Forwardism. Forwardism.